audience, and welcome to the live audience, and welcome to the virtual audience. And I think I have been invited to share on this stage for about seven or eight years. It's a deep honor. And I've been coming to this conference for 14 years. And it's interesting, every year there's a different theme. And each year the theme seems to be exactly the right theme for what we need for the year. And Emerging Stronger couldn't be more powerful for what we're needing right now. And I remember when I first heard the theme, I had these big visions, you know, emerging stronger of the phoenix rising from the ashes, of, of this hero's journey, do you know, that we were, we were going to face and slay our demons and our dragons, and we were going to find the gold and bring back the wisdom. Had these really empowered, strong visions. And yet I have to tell you that that has not been my experience at all this past year, not even a little tiny bit that I have really been struggling this past year. And I was surprised by that and disheartened. Because see, like yourself, or many of you, I've actually been preparing for this time on this planet for at least two decades. I believe in the great cycles of time. I believe that we're in the sixth math extinction. I believe in the Pachacuti that Dean was talking about yesterday, or the law of women talks about the great harvest or the ascension. I believe that we're in that right now. So I've been preparing. I've been going to conferences for two decades. I've been uh, watching movies. You know, I've watched Thrive and What the Bleep and Heal, and I've been reading a bunch of books preparing for this. And this is a true story. One of the books that got me on my way was a Greg Braden book. Um, I was living in San Francisco in the early 2000s as a lawyer, and I went to a bookstore in Berkeley. And I was not on an awakened path at that point at all. So I was not in, oh, thank you. So I was, can you hear me? Okay. So I was not at all in the spiritual section or the quantum physics section. I think I was looking for some mystery. And I was in this, in this uh, Barnes & Noble, and all of a sudden, I'm not kidding you, a book fell from the top shelf onto my head. <laughs> and it was Greg Braden's book, The Secret of the Lost Mode of Prayer. And I will say that definitely was one of the books that, that brought me on this path. So really was preparing along the way. And I don't know if you guys remember the excitement leading up to 2012. I call it the golden years, 2008 to 2012. I was living in Sedona at that time, and it was so exciting, especially here. Um, the conferences that were happening, Karen was putting on. We had a gathering of elders from all over the planet. It was so exciting. I felt like we were preparing and getting ready for this great planetary change and this shift in consciousness. And December 21st, 2012 came, and then December 22nd, 2012 came, and then 2013 came, and, and it felt like it was like business as usual. I felt this letdown a little bit. And then the years went on, and all of a sudden, it's March of 2020, and it's like, boom, Pachacuti has arrived. We're, we're here. And it wasn't at all what I thought it was going to look like. Not at all. I think I had this naive vision that we were going to be moving through this cohesive front, you know, this, this moment of solidarity. We were going to be all coming together and applying all the wisdom from these movies and these books, and we were going to be coming together as this cohesive force to, to make the change that we've been waiting for. And, and, and that didn't happen at, at all, at least for me this year, not even a little tiny bit. I expected a lot of upheaval, and I'm sure we all did. I expected political changes and economic changes, social changes, and thank goodness. You know, we need to have a lot of structures that are, are not well go by the wayside so that we can make room for something greater. But Sunny Dawn touched on something yesterday that I too felt, and that was I did not expect the division. I really didn't. I just did not see that coming this past year. It was the most um, sad and disheartening experience for me in this past year, more than anything else. And I don't mean the division in the mass um, global consciousness of the planet, you know, those people who haven't maybe been fortunate enough to start on the awakening journey. You know, I'm not talking about them. I expected division there. I didn't expect division in my own community. 
I didn't, and, and when I say my own community, I don't mean Sedona. I mean the, the global spiritual community of New Age thinkers, you know, the consciousness movement. I didn't expect it. I didn't think there would be division there at all. And I can tell you, I went through some stages of grief, of processing this. You know, the, the first stage I had was, um, I really went into victim consciousness. I really did. I, I felt sorry for myself. I, I was feeling alone, and I felt abandoned. I felt a little betrayed. Where are all my teachers? Why aren't they showing up and speaking up and leading the way like, like I needed them to? I expected them to. I thought they should. And then a lot of the teachers and, and, and the, the people that I've been following for a long, long time, I couldn't even find them anymore. I mean, they were censored. I, I, they weren't available on any of the platforms anymore. So talk about a sense of real isolation. So I want to right now, though, say thank you, thank you, thank you for the lone voices out there, the teachers that had the courage to navigate through the censorship and to find the platform and to continue to inspire. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Greg Braden. Thank you, Yukuala. Thank you, Jorge Luis Delgado. Thank you, Dean Tara Borelli. Thank you, Lynn McTaggart. Thank you, Sunny Dawn Johnston. Thank you, Dr. Beth. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Because they were alone, in my opinion, in kind of this vast spiritual community that we have. So anyway, I go from victim consciousness. I'm on the triangle of disempowerment, if you haven't noticed at this point. And I go from victim to perpetrator. And boy, I may not have been super vocal, but I was internally, I was shaming and blaming, and I was so angry. I was caught in my self-righteous anger. How dare these people not perceive the Pachacuti the way I am? How dare they have different beliefs about this? How, how dare they not apply what I think their wisdom is the way they should have done? And boy, did I get really mired in this, this indignation which is a horrible place to be. It's a place of just leaking energy and giving my power away to the point that I found myself depressed and in a dark night, really in a dark night, not understanding what the heck is going on. And as always in a dark night, the one refuge I had was what Sunny Dawn talked about yesterday. I had to get to a place to ask for help. You know, I, I really had to, to drop in and get very humble and ask spirit. I prayed to really give me some clarity about what was going on to help me navigate these times. And as always, when I ask and I'm quiet enough, um, the answers do come. And I did. I had a, a total moment of clarity around all of this. And the moment of clarity I had that, that the Pachacuti for me was less about the changes of the world having to look like this or we had to evolve like that. But the real healing and the real teaching and the real gift in this time was more that how can we learn to live harmoniously with diversity? You know, the same, the same opportunity we've been given time and time and time again. Because we don't want to live without the diversity. We don't want to live in homogenous, one new world order place. I mean, we want our diversity. And I also was very clear that the main obstacle to getting to this is the fact that we are steeped in a conditioned response, the paradigm of righting and wronging, of shaming and blaming. You know, and it's a sickness. I like to call it paradigm attachment disorder. You know, and, and we've all fallen prey to it. You know, where, where we, we believe and we're so committed to our point of view that we are trying to force others to take our beliefs. You know, when has that ever worked? You know, I don't know when ever trying to convince someone of what we believe, force it, censor it. It just doesn't work. And we have an entire history to prove that. Think of all the religious wars that have been fought. You know, Muslims, Jews, Jews, Christians, even within Christianity, Catholics, Protestants. My grandmother was born into an Orthodox Jewish family. My grandfather was born into a born-again Christian. <clears throat> and I can tell you, they had no family support. And then we have the political divisions, you know, that we felt strongly this past year. And I have another sad personal story about that. My grandfather was a fighter pilot in World War II, and his co-pilot in several missions was also his best friend. And they ended up crashing at one point and survived. And at the end of their life, they had a huge argument. One was a Republican, one was a Democrat. A huge argument. And, you know, they never spoke to each other. Never spoke to each other until they died, ever. 
So you can see that this paradigm attachment disorder really is so corrosive. And we have felt it globally this past year. You know, I don't think we've ever felt the, 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 the gravity of it because it reached all of us. It wasn't just in a geographic area. It wasn't just in the Middle East or within our own country. It affected absolutely everybody. You know, the amount of chaos and confusion, disinformation, misinformation, all of the, the censorship that's happened. We've never, ever seen this ever before. And I am very ashamed to say that I, too, fell deeply prey to paradigm attachment disorder, that I was tempted on several occasions to either limit or end friendships that I had and to unfriend teachers that I had been following for years because I didn't agree with their point of view. And I can tell you that was a low point for me because I did not show up at this time on this planet to be small and mean and petty. I did not show up to, to not be able to be present and to be able to reach people at the place that we can be reached at. And I can tell you that was a really humbling moment for me. And I knew that I had one refuge, one, and that was compassion. <clears throat> so for me, when I think about emerging stronger, I'm thinking about emerging with greater, deeper compassion. So emerging with compassion for me, first was that I really had to um, have self-compassion. I had to start here. And I had to really turn and face and acknowledge and recognize and embrace and befriend my own shadow, that I was so capable of going to that mean, small place. And then from that, I was able to really drop into the vulnerable place, to really go into the tender, raw, vulnerable place that Sunny Don talked about yesterday, my fear. My fear of the unknown, my fear of the uncertainty. I like to call it the great mystery, you know, of, 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 of why are we here, what's this all about, how do I navigate these times? And I definitely believe we've all, in one way or another, touched into that great mystery this year, you know, that, that great uncertainty. And I do know that feeling that is at its best uncomfortable and at its worst unbearable, um, especially those of us that have had trauma in our background. To not have sort of a place, safe place to land can be incredibly scary. And so I have a lot of sympathy and, and understanding of why we've developed so many coping strategies over the eons, you know, to be able to manage this fear, to be able to survive it and function in it. You know, we numb it, we suppress it, we repress it, you know, we bypass it, we ignore it, we deny it, I get that. And I will say one of the biggest coping strategies that we have, though, is we try to understand it. You know, we try to box the mystery in. We try to get points of reference, make sense of it all. And so we've created a lot of stories, and we've created mythologies, and we've created a lot of beliefs that have been passed down you know, through cultures and religions and our family of origin. And we give these stories so much power. You know, we actually start believing that these mental constructs and these thought forms are truth. They are what reality is. In fact, we start identifying with them as who we are. So that when people come along and they start threatening these beliefs, they're not just threatening a belief, they're threatening our survival. They're threatening our life. And so we see what happens when this goes on. We get hijacked by our limbic brain. All of a sudden, we're in fight and flight and freeze. All of a sudden, we are ready to defend these beliefs. And from this state, we are unable to take in any new information. So it won't matter if, if there's new information out there that might actually help us get new beliefs of hope, you know, new truths that maybe we can function in a more healthy way. We're not able to even take that in. And I can tell you, when we're in that state, we're not even relating to each other as human beings anymore. We are relating to each other's coping strategies. So I either like or dislike or resonate or judge, not the person, but your coping strategy. And we feel safe in that state with people with similar coping strategies. And I can tell you we don't feel safe with people with different coping strategies, and we tend to demonize and pathologize that. 
However, there is good news in all of this. <laughs> and the good news is the fact that we are in the Pachakuti, that we are in this amazing cycle of time, which means what Sunny Don talked about yesterday. We have access to greater awareness. Do you know that we have access to greater states of consciousness, that we have access to greater states of frequency and vibration, which means that we do not have to be victim as easily to being hijacked by our limbic system. We just don't have to. That when all of a sudden I'm activated or triggered, or you're activated or triggered, I don't have to immediately react the way I used to. That I can actually stop you know, and breathe and to take that, that blessed sacred pause, do you know, and, and really get centered, and then ask the most important question we can to get curious. What is going on here? Like, what is going on underneath all of these coping strategies and these activations? Because I can tell you what's going on. We all share. We all have the exact same longings and desires for health and a healthy immune system and to feel safe and have leaders we can trust, and have information that's truth, you know, that, that, that we can have connection, and that our families are safe. We all want the same thing. We might be going around it in different ways, but at, at the core, we all have the exact same needs, and desires, and longings. And I can tell you, we're also all, whether we're aware of it or not, grappling with that great mystery of that uncertainty, you know, of, 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 of the unknown. And I can tell you it's from that vulnerable place that we can really start seeing and hearing one another. And I can tell you, I love, um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with Rumi, the great Sufi mystic and poet, but he has this wonderful poem that goes something like this, but um, out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there's a field, and I'll meet you there. And I can tell you that's been my mantra this year, because I can tell you that field is going to be our refuge. You know, that field is the field of the vulnerability. And it's in that field that we really can come and meet one another and soothe one another and support one another. You know, be there to nurture and nourish and help make sense of all of this together. And not only is it a place of, of great healing for one another, it's a great source of inspiration. You know, that's where our creativity is. That's where inspiration lies. That's where solutions to what's going on live. It's such a beautiful, beautiful place to be, and we all have the ability to find that field. And I'll tell you, I'm very lucky, I'm very fortunate, because I happen to live and work at a living embodiment of Rumi's field. You know, you heard Dean Terabarelli yesterday. He's incredibly inspirational, and he had this vision to create a place of healing like no other. And he did do that, but he also created this incredible place of hope and of miracles. You know, um, the people that show up to the sanctuary have severe paradigm attachment disorder. I mean, they have completely bought in and identify with their addictions and their trauma, their diagnoses, their mental health labels, their personality disorders. It's so heartbreaking. They actually believe when they show up that they are broken, flawed, defective, diseased. But I will tell you, within a few days, all of that starts to shed. And they're able to drop into that field, into that vulnerable place, into what's really going on. And from that place, not only are they able to heal from their trauma, but they're able to reconnect with their soul. And they're able to reconnect with passion and purpose. And so they will often leave the sanctuary, not going back into a particularly perfect world. A lot of them have big things they have to do, relationships they have to end, changes they must make. They face grief, and they, they face uh, sorrow, and they face loss. But I will tell you, they go back out in the world different, because they're no longer sourcing from their coping strategies and their disempowering beliefs and all those stories. They are sourcing from the field. They are sourcing from that place of the soul. And I can tell you, miracles happen there. Miracles happen there. And so I'm standing here tonight, today, this morning, really wanting not just to offer another message of hope or compassion, you know, not just a theory or a concept, 
you know, I have really been the witness of the power of compassion. I've experienced the power of compassion. And I happen to think it is our best and most um, important superpower that we can now bring into this cycle of change that we're moving into so that we can really be present and show up for ourselves and others. That we are able to have that cohesive solidarity if we're able to come and stay in the vulnerable places. If we're able to see beyond all of the craziness, all of the collective insanity that all of us participate in and really speak to one another from this beautiful, beautiful place of our vulnerability. So I'm going to end with a Rumi poem because I don't know if a lot of people know it, but there's actually more to the poem than just those first few lines. <clears throat> so, out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field, and I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make any sense. So blessings and thank you so much. Have a beautiful rest of the week. Thank you.